Genesis chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. The next reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, and that's on page 1058 of the Church Bibles. Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, our subject this morning is the work of God today. Were it not so hackneyed a title, we might even call this talk, What on Earth is God Doing? In all the complexities and businesses and Pressing concerns with all the clamorous voices, turbulence, and tumult of this world. What on earth is it that God is up to? We're going to be exploring this famous incident of Zacchaeus. And the incident is not recorded by Luke at random, nor have I chosen it at random. It's not recorded by Luke at random. Luke records the story of the conversion of Zacchaeus to follow Jesus as the climax of six consecutive encounters with Jesus that together progressively unpack what it is and what it is not that Jesus is doing on earth today. So back at the beginning of this section of Luke's gospel, towards the end of chapter 17, someone put to the question, this question to Jesus, he said to Jesus, when will God's kingdom come? 
And initially, Jesus responded that God's kingdom will come in an unmistakable way at the end of time. One day, it will be absolutely plain to the whole world that the Son of Man is Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, and that the Son of Man reigns in glory. One day, it will be unmistakably plain. Jesus uses the illustration of lightning, lightning up, lighting up the sky and stretching from one end to the other. I, I don't suppose many of us have been abroad for our holidays, but you know, when you do go abroad and there you are in some foreign country and you get one of these great lightning thunderstorms and you go out onto the balcony in the, in the dark of night and you see the lightning stretch from one end of the earth to the other, and the Lord Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes ultimately, no one will miss it. Everyone will see it. No one can avoid it. Jesus will return. Jesus will come again. And when he will come, when he does come, then it'll be plain for all to see. But, but today in the present, well, how do we see this work of God? How do we see the kingdom of God? And Jesus then says, well, look, it's not immediately obvious in the present that Jesus is in the midst of you, but you may not immediately see it. And Zacchaeus shows us at the end of these six consecutive encounters what it looks like when the rule of King Jesus comes today in this not immediately obvious way. So Luke hasn't recorded this at random, and I'll allude to some of the previous five incidents as we go through. It's a great, some of you preachers here today, it's a great sermon series, actually, the end of chapter 17 through to chapter 19 and verse 27 tells us God's work today. But of course, then I haven't chosen this at random for some time now, many have been suggesting that this autumn marks something of a fresh start. <laughs> and it marks something of a fresh start for a lot of people in business, doesn't it? Uh, I see that the head of PwC, I was told on Friday, has, uh, which is an accounting, big accounting firm, has said he's expecting their employees to spend 40 to 60% of their time in the office. It'd be very hard once the boss is in the office for you not to be in the office, <laughs> you'll get passed over. We'll be going back to school, actually having to sit exams for the first time for a little while. Now, that's going to be a shock rather than being given what, given what we duly deserve. Back at university for the first time. And I have to say, as I think about the wider kind of Christian scene in England, not to sound too pompous, I think it is something of a fresh start for the evangelical world. Over the last 12 months, people have declared themselves to be on one side or another in all sorts of ways. What on earth, then, is Jesus up to as I'm back in the classroom, back in the staff room, back in the office, back in London? I was sitting in Emmanuel Church Bodmin down in the West Country with... Uh, 50 or so others, and the preacher happened to preach on this passage three weeks ago, and it really got me thinking. I thought, what a great fresh start, what a great passage. Verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's what he's up to. That's what he's doing. The unexpected scope of Jesus' work, the irresistible initiative in Jesus' work, the supernatural power of Jesus' work, the transforming power of Jesus' work, the present priority of Jesus' work. Those are going to be our four points. I haven't stolen them all from the preacher of the 8th of August, I promise. The unexpected scope. First one. Well, you can see Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He entered Jericho. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's just said he's going there to die on the cross and that he will then rise. He was passing through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief, that is, a ruler amongst the tax collectors, and he was rich. We just had the rich ruler, and now we got the ruling tax collector. 
Tax collectors were, of course, almost universally despised in the Roman world. I'm sorry if you just arrived in London to work for the Inland Revenue, but I'm afraid to say that not much has changed. Not only they collected tax for the hated Roman rulers, they were notorious for extortion and injustice, and the Romans contracted out the collection of taxes to tax collectors. The highest bidder won the contract, and the great trick was then to collect the tax, but to add as much as you possibly could on top of it. And you can see that Zacchaeus himself knew himself, or felt himself to be corrupt from verse 8, Half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it. You can see that the crowd assumes Zacchaeus to be disqualified from any sort of dealing with God. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner, verse 7. And in one of the previous six incidents, or five incidents, uh, we see the religious establishment's view of tax collectors, because the Pharisee says of the tax collectors as he's praying, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You can almost hear him spitting, can't you? So Zacchaeus is, what, the most unlikely person you would ever expect to find in church? I think it's a mistake to suggest that Zacchaeus was some kind of Norman nomates, universally despised by all as if he was a complete social outcast with no friends, because earlier in the gospel, when Levi, the tax collector, comes to Jesus, he throws a huge party and everybody comes. It's just he's religiously so far from God. Rich, rich through ill-gotten gain, rich at the expense of others, a pariah amongst the general public, but with plenty of people to join him on his luxury yacht. And when he held a party, well, perhaps reluctantly, the Hello Camera crew were there. Who, who might we say, you, know, you think this, don't you? Who might we say Zacchaeus was? Remember at the height of the banking crisis where everybody was spitting blood at the financial workers and people like Dick Fuld of Lehman's Brothers and Fred Goodwin of RBS was all over the papers, and it was almost as if people were spitting when they wrote their names. Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew, Sir Alan Sugar, Philip Green, Topshop. Perhaps then the person from your own family, I was thinking this this morning, a person from my own family, who you think is most kind of hardened to the Christian gospel, most unlikely ever to come to follow Jesus? And perhaps the person in your class or in the university rugby team or whatever, you think they, they would never in a million years. And so that Jesus should number Zacchaeus amongst those whom he's come to seek and save it widens the lens, doesn't it, substantially. Who'd have thought it? Certainly not the crowd. Certainly not the Pharisees. You know how you sometimes hear people have had the letters DNR placed on their medical notes? Maybe you've asked that for yourself. Do not resuscitate. Well, Zacchaeus, it seems there's no such thing as DNR on any individual if Zacchaeus is brought in. And it seems to me, just tangentially, this gives every single one of us in this building tremendous hope. Unless you're the most self-righteous prig, you will be deeply conscious of your own spiritual failings. Spiritual weakness, Christian inadequacy, own double standards and half-heartedness, past failures, things you've said and done. And the fact that Zacchaeus is brought in, what, what an extraordinary wonder. The unexpected scope. The irresistible initiative of Jesus' work 
Verses 3 to 6 contain what might at first glance appear to be contrasting emphases. It looks at first as if all the initiative lies with Zacchaeus, and then a closer look seems to suggest that God has been at work right the way through. And Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. Notice the blind man wanted to see, and now here is Zacchaeus seeking to see. On account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass. Jesus was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. I love the description of Zacchaeus, don't you? It's really delightful and of his action. Luke tells us he's short. I've always assumed him to have BMI several kilos over the medically recommended optimum. I've always assumed he was short and fat. I think that's totally unfair, actually. And so I'm sorry, Zacchaeus, there's no evidence of that. But something has sparked his interest, and he appears to be prepared to risk the ridicule of scurrying ahead of the crowd with his robes hitched up and shinning up into the tree. And one commentator makes this point, though Luke doesn't dwell on it. The ridicule that such an action would entail on Zacchaeus ought to be remembered. A wealthy tax collector climbing into a tree after running along a road in order to see a religious teacher would doubtless call forth mockery from all who saw him. Zacchaeus, are you sure the branch is strong enough? In fact, the preacher on Sunday the 8th of August, I will crib this from him, had this to say, if you embrace your need for mercy, your pursuit of mercy becomes more important than your sense of dignity. And that was rather beautiful, wasn't it? And given that the tax collector back in chapter 18 and the Pharisee had come to Jesus in the parable and said, I'm just not worthy. Surely we're meant to be thinking now that we find a Zacchaeus, a tax collector who wants to see Jesus, that there's something motivating him beyond mere, oh, I want to be in on the action. And so he scurries ahead and shins up the tree. But then Jesus gets to the tree, and we find that Jesus seems to know exactly what's going on. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. We need to grasp the size of the crowd. Think of the crowds when football teams come through the cities, parading whatever silverware they've won, or Olympic teams return, and everybody is cheering. In this vast crowd, there must have been people hanging on the lampposts and looking out of windows and so forth. And then there's this one individual and Jesus stops at this one tree and he looks up and he knows this individual by name and summons him down and Zacchaeus obeys immediately. You know the famous hymn of Charles Wesley, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. Jesus knows his name. Jesus summons him down, orders him down, insists that he must stay in his house today, and Zacchaeus immediately obeys with great joy. How apparently small and inconsequential a beginning sparks the start of a person's entry into Jesus' kingdom. How divinely ordained that apparently insignificant incident that causes a person ultimately to bow the knee to Jesus. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. As I said, this incident comes at the climax of Six incidents deliberately chosen by Jesus to show us how he's at work today. And if you look through the headings of chapter 18, verse 9, the kingdom comes today as sinners seek the Lord for mercy, the Pharisee, the tax collector. 
The kingdom comes today as little children come to Jesus, bringing nothing in their hand, with nothing to offer. The kingdom comes today, those who humbly come to Jesus. The kingdom comes today, not to the rich ruler who was an establishment leader who you would imagine to be the person to whom he'd done all the right things. The kingdom doesn't come through my religious performance. The kingdom comes today, Jesus foretells his death for the third time, as the Lord Jesus heads to Jerusalem and goes to his cross to die in order that sins can be forgiven. The kingdom comes today, the blind beggar, as Jesus opens people's eyes to see him. And now Zacchaeus wants to see him. And the kingdom comes today as the Lord Jesus summons somebody to him to turn to him, to follow him. I must stay at your house today. J.C. Ryle is a great uh, writer on the Gospels. It's always worth reading J.C. Ryle. He has such wonderful things to say. Our Lord stopped under the tree and said, Come down, I must abide at thy house. From that very moment, Zacchaeus was an altered man. That very night, he lay down as a Christian. We must never despise the day of small things. Never reckon anything little that concerns the soul. The way by which the Holy Spirit leads men and women to Christ are wonderful and mysterious. He's often beginning in a heart a work which shall stand to eternity when a looker-on observes nothing remarkable. In every work, there must be a beginning. In spiritual work, it's often very small. Let's not look coldly on a person because their motives are at present very poor and questionable. We don't actually know why Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He just wanted to get a glimpse. Clams up into that tree. Jesus is after him. I've no idea why you've come to church this morning. Who knows? Do you know, this time last year, two individuals walked into the Sunday evening service, six o'clock. They were walking past. One of them was an architect and was doing a project, I think, on ancient religious buildings, saw the door open and thought he must come in and have a look. The woman, I think she was his wife, we baptized them both, her just recently, had had an interest sparked in her in the Christian gospel. And so he said, oh, let's go and have a look at this building. I'm doing stuff on architecture. I've got to do something on religious buildings. They came, they found them sitting, themselves sitting down. And within a matter of weeks, they become Christians and joined the church in St. Helens. And we baptized the girl just before the summer break. Who knows what the Lord might be doing? How small a start. One of our friends out in Riga in Latvia, reading philosophy with an atheistic teacher, was encouraged in his philosophy to read Augustine so that he could understand the things that atheists were responding and arguing against read Augustine, found himself realizing that what Augustine wrote was true, became a Christian, and for six months was driving around Riga in a Porsche, age 19. He was a very bright boy who'd been recruited by Coca-Cola to run their digital stuff on Coca-Cola. For six months, he was driving around Riga in an open-top Porsche, thinking he was the only Christian in Eastern Europe. the irresistible initiative of God's work. The transforming power of God's work. Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus with joy. He has changed from rejection of God and his work to acceptance. He stands and declares his allegiance to Jesus publicly, and he shows evidence of a radical conversion. So, verses 6 through 8, he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Do you know, I've often wondered what it must have been like for the poor in Jericho that night. It must have been quite a thing, mustn't it? 
when Zacchaeus was converted and that very night gave 50% of his possessions, his capital, just gave it away to the poor. There must have been celebrations in the back streets of uh, Jericho. And notice he says, I will. He, he says, not I will one day give, I'm going to do it straight away. And notice the contrast with the rich ruler. Here is a profound work of God. As God has summoned Zacchaeus from out of the tree, it's as if he's raising up children of Abraham from the very stones. Who would have thought it? The rich ruler had all the trappings of religion. He was an establishment bigwig. He wouldn't renounce everything to follow Jesus. Zacchaeus, an absolute nobody, a ruler of tax collectors, a ruler of sinners, and overnight, radical transformation. It's important, isn't it, that we note the order of events. It's not that Jesus comes to his house because he's put his house in order. You know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, I'll become a Christian once I put my house in order. Oh, no, no, no. His house is put in order because Jesus has come to his house. Verses 6 to 8 come after verses 3 to 5. And so Jesus enters a man or a woman's life, joy, public allegiance, radical change. Now, the thing that is changed for Zacchaeus is business practice that was wrong, but I guess it could be any number of things that get changed there and then when a person comes to Jesus. Again, I remember one couple turning to follow the Lord Jesus. They were living together. They weren't married. The young man came from a home where he knew actually the Lord Jesus would want him to be married to the person he was living with. And we arranged, I think, the quickest wedding we've ever had in St. Helens. I think they were married within five weeks. We got them married in the South Transept there with about eight guests. And then we all went out for a drink in the evening. He put it right. I'm reading the text of a book at the moment on Christian manhood. It's an excellent book. It's going to be very useful when it's published. But the author very honestly says the thing for him that changed overnight was alcohol abuse and internet pornography. Overnight, he knew God would hate it. He turned around following Jesus. Jesus in his life put it right. For me, I think it was my language, actually, pretty much overnight, and sense of humor. So the unexpected scope of God's work, the irresistible initiative of God's work, we get this so wrong, don't we? I think we tend to think, oh, they could never become a Christian, just look at their life, which you would have said of Zacchaeus, rather than, who knows what's going on in their life? If they come to Jesus, Jesus will turn them around absolutely. And then finally, the present priority of God's work. As I mentioned, this incident comes at the end of these six incidents. The question has been, when will we see the kingdom of God? Jesus has answered, you will see it unmistakably. Everybody will see it. He comes back to the final coming of Jesus immediately after this incident. So this incident, these six incidents are sandwiched between the future coming of Jesus But in the present, well, how does the kingdom come today? What is it that the Son of Man is up to today? Oh, the Son of Man will come, but the Son of Man came. It's almost as if he came early, in advance of time. The Son of Man came. What's he doing today to seek and to save the lost? What is Jesus doing now? What on earth is God doing? He is seeking and saving the lost. A few concluding observations Don't narrow the lens. Don't narrow the lens in your class, amongst your university college, in your colleagues, in your friendship group, at work. Don't narrow the lens. Don't despise the day of small things, the unseen work of God going on secretly. You can't see. You've no idea what's going on in that person's life. Don't underestimate this extraordinary power of God. He will raise up from the very stones 
children for Abraham. That's his work, summoning people to be part and in fulfillment of his great promise to Abraham. And then just don't, don't miss out. This is his priority. As we go back to the office, oh yeah, there are deals to be done. Uh, there are important things to do. Oh yeah, you're going back to school. I, I, yeah, you, you ought to do some work. Uh, there are exams to pass at university. Yeah, that's important. That's it. But what's Jesus really about? He's about summoning sinners to repentance, seeking and saving the lost. And, and then notice the challenge of verse 7. The crowd grumbled. It is possible, isn't it, to be so concerned for our structures and programs as a church, so wrapped up in the life of St. Helens, that we don't actually see what really it's all about, seeking and saving the lost. Let's pray together. He came down and received him joyfully. Our Father, we praise you for the wonder that the Lord Jesus summons people like us to be amongst your people, the children of Abraham. We praise you for the extraordinary blessing of belonging to you and this wonderful work of mercy that you are about today, summoning lost sinners to repentance. We pray that you would cause each and every one of us not only to respond rightly, but also to rejoice in this great and glorious work of yours. In Jesus' name, amen.